All right, welcome to another episode of Beginner's Guide to Rust. I am Thomas, and today we're looking at enums and pattern matching. So in Rust, if you want to declare what's called an enumeration, uh, all you have to specify is this enum keyword before, and then specify name, and then you're going to specify some variations of this. So in the computer science terminology, this is actually called a tagged union. So in type theory, basically you have some type of unit type, and an enumerated type has values that are different from each other. Uh, this is typically different than assigning constants. Uh, that's sort of where this comes from a little bit. So let's say you have a, a deck of cards and you want to represent each of the playing card suites. You might have an enumeration that would be club, diamond, heart, spade, uh, to belong into each of the suites, right? So it is actually called a tag union. And this variant, variant allows us to store additional data with it. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of this is that uh, one thing is the compiler can actually check to make sure that all the cases are handled properly. And that's what Rust does is if you are doing any type of match expressions, it'll make sure that you are actually handling all of the variants. You can include data by field in this case, so that's actually called a struct, and we'll get into that in a different video. And you can also include data by index. So in these two variants, I have a, a character for the key press, and I have a string for the paste. Every data type that you include, whether it's character, string, or if the, even the fields, they all have to be fixed known size at compile time. So in C, right, you might start out with something called a union. And here we've got two different fields. One of them is a short num, and the other one is a character string. What you notice about a union is that it may have several uh, representations or formats within the same position in memory, right? So all data members would map onto the same address space. So what would the size of the object be? It's typically the size of the largest data member. This might differ from a struct, for instance, where the size of the object is actually the sum of all the fields. So let's take a look at what this looks like in memory. So let's say if you were trying to represent the number, you might have two bytes here for u16. If you're using a character, you would have all eight bytes but the same memory space is being used to represent both. So let's say you wanted to declare it. Again, we would specify the union variable here. We'd assign the num, and then we'd print it out on the number. The problem with this approach is you have to keep track of what you were assigning it to. So let's say I wanted to access this str on that union uh, representation. This actually would crash the program. So how do we know which uh, variant we're using? So let's take another example in Rust here. I've declared an enum operator with four variants for add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And I've declared in a token here, which has three variants. One of them's a number. It takes a u32, which would be four bytes. It takes an operator for the op variant. And it has a bracket that includes a character. If I want to declare a statement where I am assigning number to a token number on that enum, I would just declare it like this, token colon colon number, and I pass the actual value. Here's another example where I'm using the operator. Notice that I'm actually passing a variant of operator into the token. Here's an, op here's an example here where I'm using the bracket and I'm passing in a character. If you actually run this in the playground for Rust, you can actually see the assembly language, uh, what that actually might look like in assembly. So there's these, these, two, these two lines of code here is what I'm interested in most. There's a move L and a move B. You'll see the one, two, three, four, and you'll see that dollar sign zero as well. That second move operation is referring to what's called a tag. You'll see here actually the same thing's happening when I'm passing a token operator and a token mole. Remember that the op was the second item in our definition here, right? 
and mole was the th third one down in the operator. Now we can take a look at what the assembly looks like. You'll see here that the second line there has the number value of 1, and the move B on the line above it has a number value of 2. So that corresponds to the offset in the enumeration. And that's our tag. So let's look at the memory layout for this. So we know that we need one byte to represent the tag, which variant we're using. To represent the number, in this case, maybe a U32, we only need 32 bits or 4 bytes. What about the add operator? We need one byte, one byte for the tag, and then the variant would be one byte for the uh, tag on the operator. The bracket, one byte for the tag, and four bytes for the character. The reason why it's four bytes for the character is because we're represented as UTF-8. Rust has a little bit more involved when we get into characters and strings. I'll get into that a little bit later. So is the total 5 bytes here? Not necessarily. Rust will do some padding to make sure that it's aligned properly. So in this case, it would be 8 bytes. Let's look at the size of, of some of these operations. So here I'm printing out the size of, of the character, size of, of U32, size of the operator, and size of this particular value for op, operator, mool you'll see that it, in total it's 8 bytes to represent this token. That makes sense because operator is 1, you would have 4 bytes to represent U32, and you would have 1 byte to represent the tag. So normally the max in there would be 5 bytes, but because it is byte aligned, it's going to be 8. Similarly for the character, 4 bytes, so the max there would also have to be 5 in which case it's going to be represented with 8 bytes. Rust has this concept called an option. It's a way to represent data that either has no value or it has some value. You notice it has this generics item here. So the option enum actually takes up type T. So T can be absolutely anything. Here we're using an option of type U32. That gives it a sum value of 2. In the second example here, it's just and it's just assigning it to none. So if we look at the memory layout for that, option of U8, which would you expect to be one byte to represent U8 and one byte to represent the tag, now we have two bytes. However, in this case, let's look at the operator. Remember, the operator was one byte to represent the tag. But when we put it within a sum or an option, the total is actually one byte. This is a way that Rust can represent no null pointers. It's a concept called null pointer optimization. So this is actually called a match expression. It's a way for us to match against enumerations or any type of variable that we're looking at, or even set of variables and tuples as well. So here, if we want to do a match expression, we actually have to match out every single type of variant. So you have to specify all possible variations. Notice the use of this equals greater than character. That's just to indicate that we want to perform some statements on the right-hand side of this expression. You can also capture variables from an enumeration like we did here, web event key press C. If you want to capture variables from a structure, this is how you would do it for that way. Notice that we also can specify an entire scope. That scope can either be a one-liner or it can be a set of statements. You can also use this to return values as well. You can even combine it with an if statement. So if you want to have conditions that a variant also matches, then they will match both of those at the same time. So if you look at the Rust book, it kind of goes over in detail about the match control flow operator. I'll leave a link in the description.
as well, you have the option here, right, that I mentioned, the none and the sum. Again, that matches our exhaustive. One last thing here is you have this underscore character. I briefly mentioned this in a different video, but basically you can make sure that you have a base case that anything after that, it will just match that expression. If you go to cheats.rs, it gives you a nice little overview of all the types of ways that you can use the pattern matching. Some of them might even include the use of range, right? 1.3, 1 inclusive, and a lot of other examples. All right, so let's look at some code here. So I'm going to open up a calculator implementation that I created in a different video. So notice here I've got the operator with different operations, tokens for number U32, operator, and bracket. I also have an error that I'm specifying a bad token and a mismatch parentheses. If we go into this parse function here, actually, you know what? Let's go to our main here. Ignoring for the example that we're how we're actually reading it from standard in right now, reading a line. Just look at these variants here. So I'm specifying what's called a result. That's a different type of enumeration. Because if you go standard in IO, standard in, read line, you'll see that it returns an enumeration called result. That means it's either going to be OK or an error. The OK value will be a U size, which indicates the number of bytes that it was read. So here I'm creating a calculator, and I'm calling that parse input. In the other case, I may, if it's an error, then I'll it just return an error. So let's look at our parse function. Ignoring for the rest of the sections, the main thing I want to look at here is the for loop around the characters. Notice that I'm matching on a on the C, an individual character. And I'm using this range operation to say, well, if it's 0 through 9, then I'm going to do another match operation on it and match on the sum value or a base case. If it happens to be open paren or close paren, then I am creating a token for a bracket, as well as some of these other tokens for the operators. Let's look at some other examples here. Here's a very simple example that I was implementing an HTTP server. Here I've created a function called status code that takes a code of i32 and it returns an i32. This is just a way for me to say like, well, I'm only handling 200, 400, and 404s and I'm returning a code. Notice that I'm using this uh, pipe here and that kind of indicates a way to do ors or within a match expression. Here's another function here where I'm specifying a status code and I'm returning a string. In a different video, similar to this, we were implementing a uh, what was called a radix tree, and that was so that we could implement a router for our HTTP server. In the git function here, I'm splitting on the path, and then I have four different cases that I want to match on. One of them is where the root happens to be some variable, and the path that the postfix variable happens to be empty. If you haven't watched that video, uh, go ahead and go watch that, and that might help create some context for this one. And you notice the base case here is none. Let's look at some other examples. So in this example, we're looking at an LRU. In the LRU cache, I needed to implement something that would be able to move around the nodes of the tree. 
So here I'm just using a result for the option or the options, and I'm matching on none or some. Another good example might be, let's say we're looking at iterators and the binary search tree. Here I've implemented an iterator, and that'll be something we get into a different video. But you notice here I can actually specify multiple items when I pass in the match, and then I have these different expressions that I want to match against. Notice I'm also using this conditional thing here where I'm saying if the queue happens to be empty, then I will want to execute this statement to return none. Yeah. So hopefully that was helpful. That's a good overview of match expressions and enums. If you want to learn more, go check out the, some of the links I put down below. I have a number of programming exercises on the channel that should help kind of reinforce some of these basic concepts, especially pattern matching, because it's something that you use quite a lot in Rust. If you like this video, please give it a like. Give it a subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And I'll see you all in the next one.